so I'd like to introduce our speaker today, Peter Vimalian, who is the Philip J. King Professor of Egyptology here at Harvard and director of the Semitic Museum and director of uh, the Giza Project here at Harvard and teaches classes in pyramids and pharaohs and digging ancient Egypt and has been using technology in novel ways in his courses for a long time, including but not limited to multimedia assignments, AR and VR. Um, he has done things in 3D scanning and had his students do that in 3D creation. So please welcome uh, Peter. Thank you, sir. Thanks very much, Kevin. Not the cutting edge of technology, the bleeding edge of technology. <laughs> Sometimes with disastrous results, but I thought I'd just give you a little smattering of what we've been doing over the last couple of years and some of our interesting experiments and things. This is about technology as it applies to the ancient world and archaeology, and specifically about ancient Egypt, as you can see here. So take a break, thaw from the cold outside. I promise I will show you some sunny, warm pictures of the desert and uh, try to help you out a little bit. So not every shot will be from the site of Giza today, because we've been doing other experiments with other parts of the country. But most of my work focuses on this site, the Giza pyramids, just west of modern Cairo. And you're looking at the three famous pyramids, the big ones, with the Great Pyramid on the right of Khufu, built first, and then Khafre, and then Ben Khafre, and the Sphinx down below there. It's a nice aerial shot looking to the west. I might add that between the two big pyramids, the middle and the right, about a mile behind this photo is the Grand Egyptian Museum, which is being built and is supposed to open next year, at the end of next year. That is the biggest museum in the world, and an awful lot of Giza objects will be moving there. So this is my favorite place on Earth, aside from Harvard Square, of course. <laughs> and what's fascinating about it is not just the three famous pyramids, but you can see beyond there all those little rectangular boxes. Those are tombs of the elites of the Egyptian Old Kingdom. So think roughly 2500 BC or so. And it's a fabulous place. It's not just a cemetery, but it's urban planning for the dead. This was a live administrative area with priests and people deciding where your tombs go and how deep your burial shafts can go and how they can't crash into each other and all kinds of cool stuff. And this shows the first flowering of Egyptian civilization. This is the Old Kingdom or Pyramid Age when everything comes together. So you don't build this stuff without tremendous project management skills, control of resources all over the country, not just local quarries and things. In fact, we just found the world's oldest papyri on the Red Sea coast of all places that talk about building the pyramids and hauling materials from as far away as the Red Sea to Giza. And we even found a journal of one of the Egyptians talking about lugging stones around and how long it takes to get there and all kinds of people involved. So this is a pretty exciting time to be, uh, to be studying this stuff. And it's got a great connection to Harvard as well because the man who orchestrated all of this was my predecessor, George Reisner, class of 1889. You can see in those days they did the class photos at, uh, in front of Men Hall, right there, in front of the door facing the yard. Those were the good old days. He worked and lived at Giza for most of his life. He only came back here to teach about four semesters or so. Nice work if you could get it, huh? It's almost like permanent sabbatical. But he was an archaeologist through and through, and really one of the founding fathers of modern responsible scientific method. By the time he was done, all of those sites you see in red were Harvard University and Boston Museum of Fine Arts expedition sites with Reisner directing them. And he lived up at Giza most of the time. 23 sites over 40 years, but the pyramids are the most important one. This is just a smattering of the masterpieces that he found along the way, not just in Egypt, but also in Nubia. So he died in um, 1942, it was the middle of World War II, nobody could figure out what to do until the war ended and then Boston people went out to the site and decided it was time to pack up. And so all of these archives came home to Boston. 45,000 glass plate negatives, untold thousands of pages of manuscripts and diaries and notes, drawings, maps and plans in all sizes, healthy and brittle and all kinds of stuff. So our goal beginning in 2000 when I was a curator at the MFA was to try to merge all this stuff together, to digitize it, link it intelligently, and create a website for the interested public and for scholarship. Because coming to Boston on a three-day grant is not going to get you through all of those boxes in time. So our mission statement or our strategy plan is right here on this one slide. In the middle is a single tomb. It's called a mastaba in Arabic because it looks like a bench or a mastaba that was outside Arabic homes. 
So these are the tombs of the elites. And for every one of these mastabas excavated, there's all this stuff that links to it. So for a given tomb, there might be 20 old photos and 100 new photos or objects found, statuary or drawings or plans or maps or old publications or unpublished manuscripts. So our project beginning in 2000 was to link all of this stuff together. We started with a website in 2005, and then in the last couple of years, we've got a brand new enhanced one here at Harvard, hosted here, and there it is. And if you go just to the search button and click, you'll see all the totals. It's about 77,000 photographs on there, and a whole bunch of other stuff, 4,000 tombs, and lots of uh, publications you can download for free. We are now trying to convert all of our media assets over to the Harvard Library System, convert them to JPEG 2000, get Mirador working, that's the triple IF compliant image viewer that's going to be very cool. And our My Giza function will be working at some point too so that you can share and save collections and put things together for your own presentations and stuff. So lots of uh, good stuff coming. Even back before we started playing with this stuff digitally, George Reisner was already thinking ahead, which is kind of cool. And in 1906 to 7, he told his photographer to climb up a third of the way up the smallest pyramid and take a photograph of the progress of the excavations every night. This is just the pyramid temple on the east side of the smallest pyramid of Menkare. And so we put this together for our Harvard X online course, and I think Yasha is here somewhere in the Harvard X team who worked so hard on putting this class together. And this is the kind of fun stuff you start to think, wow, way back in 1907, George Reisner was already thinking about time-lapse photography and movies and things. So we rounded up these glass plate negatives and put it together, and you can watch the whole site emerge all the way back to the bottom of the image there where the holy of holies of the sanctuary appears. And even George Reiser didn't think the temple went back that far, so it cost him a lot more money than he originally budgeted to excavate this. But some of the greatest uh, statuary finds were found at this temple, and it was quite, a, quite an operation. So we've taken all of that lead and all of those materials and thought in the last decade or so that we can start going in a visualization direction and try to recreate Giza at various points in time. In this case, it's just a snippet from one of our models showing the quarry zone where the blocks were hauled up to the pyramid, put course by course as the pyramid rose. And then this area became a cemetery as well. High officials started building their tombs on those terraces and cutting them into the rock walls and things. So we have a specialization classroom. It's called the Viz Lab or Visualization Lab. It's one floor above the geological lecture hall down on Oxford Street. And we have these models in 3D. Students come in and put on 3D glasses and visualize all of this. We dive down burial shafts and hunt around, not just building the pyramids, but also going into some of the most beautiful uh, tomb chapels that we have. This is one on the east side of the Great Pyramid. And coming inside, it almost looks as good as a video game, but it's actually based on sound archaeology. And we can restore all these colors because they're still so beautifully preserved as you see in the photo in the upper right. Upper left is discovery year in 1927. Upper right is what it looks like today, and that allows us to restore all those colors with some pretty good um, certainty. So a lot of what I'll show you today goes into this course. I teach this in the fall. We just finished last semester, which was a lot of fun. It's in the visualization lab. The room holds about 20 people or so at a time. And the material from the Giza website, from all this old traditional archaeological research and the new visualization techniques go into this class. And we've been trying some interesting experiments. For example, so that the students wouldn't just be passive consumers of this material, we thought, let's make them active contributors this time. And so we teamed up with our partners from Dassault System, that's a French 3D modeling company based in Paris, but also their US headquarters is right here in Waltham. And they wanted to try out their new X-Design software. And we said, OK, let's make this work. And we'll give every student a tomb to build in 3D over the course of the semester. So they set up tutorials. And we had specialized TFs to help us with this. And over the course of the term, each one of them started to build one of these mastabas. And we'll see if they're good enough now to plug into our overall tomb model. We added another dimension to this class by uh, adding Oculus Go headsets. And so for certain periods of time, students were able to uh, become avatars. Maybe you can see them in some of those images, those floating torsos cruising around there, which is kind of fun. And we used a software called Rumi, which we were experimenting with, a kind of a virtual 
meeting uh, software, almost like Zoom, except you're really there and you're walking around and you can fire these emoticons out of your head so little love hearts go shooting up in the air when you like something the professor said, and that worked pretty well. In the visualization lab, that screen is so big, too, that you can see where I'm standing there, it's almost the right scale, and I'm almost in the tomb at the right human proportions, which is fun. And then we tried even a crazier experiment, which was not just the virtual reality aspect of it, but we connected the class live to China, to Zhejiang University, and about 17 students there joined the class and listened in on the content and participated. And kudos to them, because this class met at 10.30 in the morning, our time, 10.30 in the evening in China, so they were up late. Occasionally they would all come to the classroom at the university and participate that way. Most of the time they were using Zoom and they were all at home in their dorm rooms. And I kept wondering, how come they're not speaking up more and contributing more until I realized that they didn't want to wake their roommates sleeping in the same room <laughs> while they were trying to participate in the class. But we worked our way around that and it was actually quite fun. What I was almost most interested in, and not just sharing the Giza content with them, of course, but having their participation and having the Harvard students be able to talk to the Chinese students, you know, not just about Giza, of course, and archaeology, but, hey, what it's like to study in China, what's it like to study at Harvard? And their English was pretty good over there, thank God, because my Chinese is non-existent. And we had some great participants, and I'm hoping to repeat that experiment again. They didn't get any official Harvard course credit for this, so all the more kudos to them for being willing to stay up late and participate in the class this way. And these technologies really are pretty amazing. Once you put the headset on, you're really there. You know, you're just seeing it on the screen behind these people, and it's not quite as impressive. Um, there are lots of different ways to experience this. Sometimes what you show is on the screen for the whole class. Sometimes it's a one person, one user experience like this. And so that one person is getting the full immersive 3D environment, walking around in that tomb while the rest of the class looks on. And you have to tell these people, move your head slowly or else everyone else will throw up. <laughs> it's very dizzifying if you're not the person actually looking around. But um, lots of different headsets from big to small, from expensive to cheap. And I think the general trend is moving away from these expensive specialized rooms down to ever cheaper, ever smaller technologies, to the point where it's a Google Cardboard or it's in your phone already and the classroom comes to you. You don't have to go to this specialized place. And production values are getting better and better. This is not something we created. In fact, it's not even Giza. It's a later period. But it's about the best uh, virtual reality experience that I've seen so far. It's a New Kingdom tune from the Valley of the Queens. So a couple of other fun experiments we've been doing over the years. Here is a 1925 experiment or, or discovery that our expedition made. George Reisner was actually here one of the few times he was teaching at Harvard, and he told his team to start digging all of those rectangular tombs on the east side of the Great Pyramid until his photographer's tripod slipped right where that red circle is, and he realized there was some white plaster covering the ground. It was definitely trying to hide something and there was no superstructure above ground, so definitely something was being hidden here. So they went down and they went down, not 10, not 20, not 30 feet, but about 90 feet all the way down and ended up in this unfinished burial chamber with all this deteriorated stuff. And by that time, Reisner said, shut the thing down until I can get back there and show you how archaeology is really done. <laughs> and he did, and they spent the next two years lying on mattresses, picking up with the tweezers every tiny fragment meticulously recording what fell in what direction, what was related to what else. There's gold here, there's hieroglyphs, there's ceramics, there's broken furniture. And eventually they figured out that this seems to be the tomb of Khufu's mother, the mother of the king who built the Great Pyramid, because they could read the inscriptions even in that mess there. Pretty amazing discovery. And what you're seeing, believe it or not, is a lot of the funerary furniture of this queen. She had this big bed canopy, maybe on top of the sarcophagus, you can see some of the poles are still there before they were removed. That was holding up this square bed canopy. There was a carrying chair, there was a bed, a curtain box, two chairs, one simple and one fancy. And thanks to that meticulous work, they were able to reconstruct what this furniture looked like. It's the oldest furniture group from the ancient world, about 2,500 BC or so. So up above is the reconstructed set with modern wood and ancient uh, gilding in the Cairo Museum. And down below, the MFA made another modern replica, but that is no longer on view. But we thought, 
you know, all that stuff is done, but there's that second chair, which is so fancy and wonderful, and no one could figure out what it looked like until about 1949. So we went back to the Cairo Museum and we asked if we could see all the thousands of tiny fragments of gold and faience and these arms from this falcon-shaped arms of the chair. And this is the 1949 drawing by the archaeologists finally discerning what this thing should have looked like. We went to the records. You can see why no one could put it together. What a mess, right? Trying to figure out what to do. But we finally did it. We created a 3D model. We rebuilt the whole tomb in virtual reality. And then we thought, let's go in the opposite direction for a change and see if we can make the real thing based on the virtual model. So we're going backwards. Usually you start with reality and you try to make some kind of virtual approximation. So using a CNC router, it's just a carving machine driven by the computer, not by humans, because we are lousy craftsmen and we could never do this kind of woodwork ourselves. We actually carved all the bits and pieces and put the whole thing together. We got the ceramics program across the river to help and teach us how to make uh, fans tiles, like the ancient ones you see down below. We got some gold from a mom and pop shop in Brooklyn, New York, gilded the whole thing, and please come to the Semitic Museum and see the results, which are on view on our second floor there. This is the only example of the reconstructed second chair of Queen Hedda Paris with all that wonderful symbolism and shiny real gold. Another project at the Semitic Museum that we're working on is around the walls, which you can barely see in the dark there, but up above is an example. In, 100 years ago, museums were buying replicas, plaster casts of famous pieces to use as teaching tools. The Metropolitan did it, the MFA did it, the Semitic Museum did it as well. And those tall things on the floor in the middle, those are 100-year-old modern plaster casts of famous Mesopotamian monuments. Around the walls, those are only one or two years old. We took our fragile, heavy plaster casts that were full of holes and dirty and falling apart that showed all these Assyrian palace wall reliefs, and we figured out a way make, to make uh, rubbery molds of them and modern resin lightweight casts using students to help us out. So all around the walls now are these fantastic palace reliefs. And I show you this because we're now working on an augmented reality app where you'll be able to aim your phone at all these different reliefs and they will come to life. So for example, the chariot wheels will start spinning, or the colors on the original costumes will come back, or that lion will roar and fall over and die. We'll have an augmented reality Assyrian guide who will let you into the palace and tell you that the king is too busy to see you, but you can look around in the meantime. So I'm an Egyptologist, not an Assyriologist, so I was starting to get really jealous when I saw all this coming together, and I thought, can't we do this for Egypt too? So we chose something appropriate, this is the Sphinx at Giza, and between its paws there, you see a stela that dates to a thousand years after the Sphinx. This was added by a young prince who liked to tool around Giza in his chariot and enjoy the sights, and one day, supposedly, he fell asleep in the shadow of the Sphinx. The Sphinx appeared to him in a dream and said, dude, I am covered in sand. If you will dig me out, I will make you pharaoh. And he did, and he did. And so Moses IV got to the throne in the 18th dynasty and he grabbed this piece of granite from the second pyramid and carved that story and set it up between the paws of the Sphinx. It's a great piece of propaganda. Whether it really happened, I don't know, I don't care. But we knew that there was a plaster cast and a mold made from the stela. So we went to Belgium and made our rubbery mold and brought it back. And we thought this time we could use colored resins, not just a beige color, but try to put the whole thing together and there's our curator, Adam Asia, with his wonderful analog technique to try to create this thing and pull the mold back. And in two sections, we recreated the world's only full-size resin-colored, pink granite-like looking replica of the dream stela of the Musa the fourth. And we set this up on our second floor. So that's the analog part of the project. And then the digital part was we couldn't recreate the Sphinx. I don't have that kind of budget and the ceiling doesn't go up that high anyway. So we thought, what if you can aim your device and let some cool things happen? So this looks like people are just texting their friends, but they're actually all using the app, which you can download. It's called Dreaming the Sphinx. It's on the Apple App Store and the Google Play Store. And um, it's a free download, of course. And it does a couple of interesting things. One is aim, and you'll get a augmented reality line drawing of the text on there. And you can push those little round buttons and learn little fun facts about the stela. But more interesting are the two round buttons down at the bottom, is you can click the bottom right one and actually get a line-by-line -line translation. So, bingo, you're an Egyptologist all of a sudden. 
and you hit the next button and it shows you the next bit of text, eventually it gets down to the horizontal inscription where it talks about the, the nap and the dream and becoming king and what the Sphinx told the young prince, all of that. So you can scroll up and down and read all of that. We're now working on phase two, if I get one of my next internal Harvard grants, to build this out a little bit and add a few more elements that are between the, uh, the legs of the Sphinx there. Another element is the button on the lower left, which will then take you to Giza without buying a plane ticket. And now there you are, between the paws, and you can look around in 360, it's a panorama. But you can also move that time slider at the bottom and move back and forth in time, from the way it looks today to the way it looked in 1400 BC when Thutmose had his dream and erected the stela, or you can go all the way back to the Old Kingdom when the Sphinx is there, a thousand years earlier, but there isn't a stela yet. So that was kind of fun to try to work that. And then the last bit is you can aim at a target we put on the floor and an augmented reality Sphinx appears right in front of you. And again, you can move the time slider from the Old Kingdom there to the New Kingdom when the stela and a royal statue is added there between the paws. You can kneel down on the floor and get up close and personal and then switch again to the present day and see what it looks like. So these are kind of fun. I was playing with these at home and you know my cats were jumping up on the table as if they could see the Sphinx. Or when I try to make movies of this and I start filming it until I realize it's not there and I'm filming the empty floor. So <laughs> augmented reality can do a lot of fun tricks on the mind, but uh, it really looks like it's there. It's kind of fun. And you can do all this right at home. You can click the button when you open the app that says I'm at the museum or I'm at home. And if you're at home, you can see on the phone there, there's just a very simple two page PDF with hieroglyphs, that's your QR code. Print those out and aim your phone at it and the stela pops up right in your living room or the Sphinx pops up. Doesn't have to be on your phone, of course, it could be wherever you are. So that's been an interesting combination of analog and digital experiments. And we're always looking for ways to try to bring Egypt alive, things like this little merge cube where you can aim at it and load one of your 3D models of uh, Egyptian statuary as a way to kind of get up close and personal. They don't have the color or the texture quite working yet, but we contacted the company and said, hey, get on the stick and make these things more realistic. So we're doing that. So all of this stuff is not tangible. It's not real quite yet, but we're moving into the next phase of all of this. We got a $24,000 portable 3D scanner in the Semitic Museum. It looks like a clothing iron, doesn't it? And it's a structured light scanner. So what you do is aim at your device and try to fill in all the holes a little bit. You can see the model appears there in real time. And we've been working on this for quite some time. In fact, with a Bliss Fellowship last summer, we had an undergraduate working full-time 10 weeks scanning the entire Egyptian collection of the Semitic Museum. So we're not like the Met. We don't have 50,000 pieces, but it's about 350 or so objects. And they are all now completely scanned, and we're loading them up onto a Sketchpad page. And I'm going to make them free, downloadable, and available to everybody. So this is fun. These are teaching tools. These are ways to study objects in ways that you can't in museums. You know, sometimes they're up against the wall, and you can't walk all the way around it, or you can't see the hieroglyphs on the back, but in this way that you can, which uh, makes a lot of good sense. And I'm a believer in making these things accessible. I don't think we're out to make money or charge people to download or, or print these things. So uh, on our Sketchfab page, they will be up and running pretty soon. And in my Gen Ed class, which is called Pyramid Schemes, we have a virtual curation assignment. You can write a paper, you can do an iMovie, or you can do this assignment where you can choose your 3D objects from this library on Sketchfab and then build your own virtual gallery and then defend your story. You know, what are you trying to tell? Is it royal objects and non-royal, or daily life versus funerary, or big versus little, whatever you're doing. So the scanning and the virtual models are working. The next step, of course, is physical stuff, things that we can hand around in class when we can't bring people into storage or open up display cases or things. So we were very fortunate to get three 3D printers donated from the Sindo company, a South Korean company, and start printing these guys out. And along the way, we're learning about the, the technologies. Most of the time, 3D printing is tiny and pretty useless, is what we found out. You know, they're the size of things you get in your breakfast cereal. Do you still get things in your breakfast cereal? Like Cracker, cracker Jack boxes and things. Not really great teaching tools. You know, you can't read the hieroglyphs when they're one inch tall or two inches tall. But when you can start to go bigger, then things get more interesting. So here's the lid 
of a canopic jar, one of the four jars that hold the mummy's internal organs. And we have about three of these in the Semitic collection. And so that's a time lapse of about an 80 hour printing job. So it takes a little while. The filament, which is wrapped around a cartridge, it looks like a plastic thread, costs about $29 a package. So this is maybe taking up half a package or so. And it's been interesting to try to experiment with this. What we're learning along the way is if you want to 3D print, then the 3D structured light scanner is the way to go. If you want um, good looking models, you can use photogrammetry, which is just taking 100 pictures of an object from all different size and stitching them all together in software such as PhotoScan. So it depends on whether you just want an online model to ro rotate around or whether you really want to print it out and get a high quality. For me, as an Egyptologist, reading the hieroglyphs is paramount. So the middle metal scarab there in the middle shot, that's a metal reproduction of a famous text, and you can see the hieroglyphs are pretty readable. In the 3D printed version on the left and the right, the white one and the blue one, we're not quite there. And it's not just because the light is too bright in this room, it's really kind of hard to read the hieroglyphs. So we're learning along the way how to sharpen this stuff. It's quite an art form how you angle or set your statue so that layer by layer the printer is printing and you try to get some good results. This is called a ceramic funerary cone. And if you look on the right where the arrow is pointing, that's an Egyptian representation of a tomb entrance. And these round ceramic cones were actually inserted above the doorway, stamped with the names and titles of the deceased. And so there are many of these you know, stamped with the same inscription for a given individual and we're trying to print these as well. So above you see the ancient one, and the photo on the upper right shows the cone is kind of broken off at the bottom, but the only inscribed part is that, that round bit up there. And so we're trying to get these hieroglyphs more readable, sharper. This is a material called PLA. There are other printers that use resin that kind of are, are like goop and you know do it faster, and uh, lots of ways to experiment with that. And then again, these are fairly limited in size, about a I don't know, grapefruit, or maybe if you're lucky, a basketball would be possible, but you need the industrial strength additions to get things really uh, much bigger. We're in the process of um, having an agreement for residency at Autodesk downtown, and I hope that we'll be doing full-size stuff, really big stuff, pretty soon. So it's great to have these as teaching tools, as research tools, things you can hand around to the students in class, get a little bit tactile. Another experiment that um, was kind of fun just happened last month. This is the upper part of a statue from about 600 BC, not from Giza, but the original is in the Museum of Fine Arts. But many, many years ago, they made a replica, and so there's the yeah. replica that I own. And so we 3D scanned that, and there it is coming out of the machine, bit by bit. It took most of a week or so to get that out. And why am I doing this? Well, I know where the body is. The body is in the Cairo Museum in Egypt, and so my thought was to try to take this to Cairo and put the two things back together again if I could get the permissions from the Egyptians. So we made a bunch of these, one in so it's greenish color and one in gray. I decided to take the green one to Egypt. Can anyone think why? So it would look garish and plasticky enough and no one would accuse me of walking around in antiquity. I'm not stupid. And then I thought, I'll donate it to the Egyptians so when I leave the museum, I'm not walking out with this thing under my arm, too. So, and I didn't want to go back to the airport with it in my suitcase. So I wrote to my friends at the Cairo Museum, that's the orange-looking building on the left, where I promptly learned that they'd already moved the body out to the Grand Egyptian Museum over on the right, which is coming to completion. It's just a less than a mile or so to the, uh, the north and the west of the Giza pyramids. You see some of the private tombs in the foreground there and the museum in the back. So this was a month ago. I went out there with some friends. It happened to be in the middle of a sandstorm. So that idyllic view of the pyramids from the museum was just an orange mist and I couldn't see a thing. But we went into the conservation center and met with the director there and they hauled out the body for me and we tried to put this guy together and it was a pretty cool fit. So I was delighted that uh, you know, bringing things from all the way across the world actually does work. I don't know if they'll put this on view, you know, the color combination is not great. I did choose green originally because the ancient stone is a kind of a greenish slate or, or basalt or schist, but in these photos it really came out looking a lot more, a lot more bluish. So these are some of the other fun tricks that you can play with going from the virtual world to the real world and then joining things up again and um, playing reconstruction. 
at the site, there are different ways to try to make Giza more accessible too. And if I ever win the lottery, I dream of flying drones over the pyramids and over those streets of tombs, systematically recording everything in 360 degrees, walking with the Google Street View type backpacks up and down on the ground, and ultimately merging all the ancient, not ancient, all the older traditional archeological data, the, pho the photographs and the diaries and maps and plans, merging that stuff with these new user interfaces, basically, so that you can hover around, fly, dive down a burial shaft, decide that, oh, that's an interesting wall, click on it and up pops the discovery photo or the statue that was found in the corner of the room, for example, look around in any direction, click on a wall, get a translation of the hieroglyphs. All of this is doable and it's all there. It's just a question of time, money, people, the Egyptian military who freak out whenever you talk about drones. Drones are still not quite legal in most excavations in Egypt, but we need to, uh, to work on that. So the potential for all this stuff is limitless. This is a shot of the interior courtyard of the Cairo Museum. Many of these objects will move to the, um, the Grand Egyptian Museum out there. And when they're not encased in plexi or glass, you know, you can do photogrammetry, you can scan this stuff. There's just um, tremendous potential. Why do we do it and what kinds of intellectual property questions does this raise? It's really quite a fascinating topic. Some museums are ready to give it away, others are freaking out and thinking that they're going to go with a mold to China and make 5,000 of them, and sell them and make a fortune on their intellectual property. So you get the whole gamut of reactions to where this stuff is going. It raises interesting questions about who owns the past, who owns the rights to reconstruct or reproduce or replicate the past, and a value thing, right? You know, oh, that's no good, it's a replica. The ancient one is over here. What's your goal? What are you trying to teach? What are you trying to research? And, and what will bring people in or help students out? So if you're interested in this stuff, my Giza class comes around uh, next fall, I think, and probably after that. For any students in the group, I do a gen ed class, which is, um, covers Giza a little bit, but tries to give a whole survey of all of Egyptian civilization. This is about to morph from the old gen ed to the new gen ed next spring into uh, pyramid schemes. I think it's now called What Can Ancient Egyptian Civilization Teach Us? As soon as I find out, I'll put that into the syllabus for, <laughs> for next year. But this stuff is practical. Who says it isn't practical? <laughs> What's more practical than hieroglyphic cookies, right? <laughs> So, um, and we, we teach language courses too, introductions to hieroglyphs. So once you take that class, you will know that this rolling pin actually makes no sense <laughs> whatsoever. But who cares? I want to eat those cookies. So I bought one of these. It was on Etsy. You can get one too. So just a brief overview of some of the fun that we're having, some of the directions we could go. And, you know, with really big funding, it could just get more ambitious still and, and really more exciting. A lot of bang for the, uh, for the buck. None of this, of course, is a replacement for the real thing, and I would never suggest that you skip out on a chance to go to Egypt. Seeing the actual monuments is spectacular, and in fact, in the reverse, I hope that all these virtual and augmented reality experiences get people more excited to see the real thing and head out to the, uh, the actual sites. Putting the two together is what I've learned from teaching, from doing these field trips to the visualization lab, to going to the MFA, combining the replications, the technologies, the immersive stuff with visits to the real antiquities, that's the best of both worlds when students can get a, a combination of all of that. So you're not just wallowing in technology and you're not just dragging them through galleries, but put it together and it actually starts to mean something. Thanks very much. So I think I raced through that. We have some time for questions if I can uh, answer any, happy to do so. Maybe I'll bring up the uh, Giza website while we wait. Yeah. Um, so the, uh, the images are so luscious and I just have to think you, you must be pelted with requests for licensing um, <laughs> for games and, and who knows what all. So I'm wondering if you could shed some light on that. I wish, I would love to be sending invoices out all the time. That would be a fabulous <laughs> way to fund this. Actually, um, here's the Giza website, and like I said, if you just hit the search button, you'll see over here, can I make this bigger? This is what we have in there, so 77,000 photos now in the process of heading over to the DRS, the library system. But we don't own a lot of this. 
So many of my color photos, of course, are on the website, and I'm happy for people to use them. But we're sort of the relayer or the middle person. We have the Harvard MFA expedition, but that's technically owned by the MFA. That's where the glass plates are. And then we have material from Vienna, from Turin, from Hildesheim, Berlin, Leipzig, Philadelphia, and Berkeley. And our system, and some of the, the image viewer things are in place, if you want to publish an image, it will send an email to Vienna saying, hey, this guy wants to publish that image. So we're not stuck charging or determining what Vienna wants to do or having to write Vienna and say, hey, someone on our website wants to publish your image. What do you want to do? That's too much bureaucracy. So we're um, not copyright holders, but we're kind of an amalgamator. And we hope that people will then go off to the proper owners if they want to do something more with it. I wish we could charge. Um, but the point is to make this stuff accessible. And so I hope we never have to go to a subscriber model where just to get into the site is going to cost somebody something. Great question. Yeah. yeah. Hey, what, um, what technologies did you use to sync up the uh, experience with the Chinese class? Yeah, we played with a lot of different things. Um, basically, it was Zoom, so just like the Extension School uses, so that all of the students in their dorm rooms could participate. Um, there were some ups and downs with bandwidth issues, and then especially when we wanted to do the headsets, whether in the Roomy software or uh, to try to get them access to some of the virtual reality models. There were times when it worked better than other times. And in fact, when we really planned a special evening where I had the Harvard students come to class at 7 p.m. on a Sunday night, I got a pizza, so that it would be 7 or 8 a.m. in China, and those students for once would have a civilized time to come into class. Maybe some of you think 8 a.m. is not a civilized time to come into class, but it was better than midnight. Um, at that time, we were actually putting on the, the Oculus Go headsets, and the Chinese couldn't get into the model. So the Harvard students were having a great time being those floating avatar torsos and firing emoticons and things, and the Chinese couldn't quite participate, and that was frustrating. So we want to do that again and solve the, the bandwidth issues. Um, the other frustrating thing was this. So because the room doesn't have ambient mics all around, it wasn't a free-flowing discussion where anyone could say something and the other group would hear. It was, wait till I bring you the microphone and ask your question. And in Zoom, um, sometimes the Chinese students in their dormitories, you know, they'd want to talk and you try to call on them and their picture would go big on the screen and then there was no audio. And so you had to let them type their question and I would read it and respond that way. So definitely the technology got in the way. It could have been a more seamless experience. But we'll be meeting with um, Dassault System about their X-Design software tomorrow, in a couple of days, to see how we can improve that next year. And I'm sure the bandwidth and the connection issues will be better next time around. So I'm looking forward to that. Other questions? Yeah. You talked about a lot of different technologies, from AR to VR to 3D printing and mm -hmm. photogrammetry. Um, as a teaching tool, if you had a limited budget, which one would you point somebody towards? Great question, because most of what I teach is the history, the archaeology, the language, and a lot of this stuff is byproducts. I don't. I do teach a course on digital epigraphy, how to make digital line, facsimile line drawings of tomb scenes and inscriptions for scholarship, but I don't teach a GIS class, I don't teach a photogrammetry class or a 3D modeling class, and a lot of those skills I don't have personally. I'm more of a 2D guy than a 3D guy. Um, so it depends on what the course is and what the ultimate goal is, and if there's enough time for these technologies. Um, I was concerned about the tomb building exercise for the students, and I wanted to make sure there was a separate TF comfortable in CAD-like tomb building so they could say, hey, I'm really stuck on how to make this wall taller, and they would get the help that they need. So that was kind of a, a first experiment. Um, yeah, it really just depends on the course and how big it is and how much help you can give. Um, for our virtual curation assignment in the gen ed class, I always tell them this is a gallery designing exercise and a story that you need to tell and defend. It's not a technology assignment. So go to the box Center. Let Marlon Kuzmich show you how Cinema 4D works. If you want that pedestal to be taller or that wall to be blue, get them to help you and make it happen. I don't want you wallowing and drowning in the technology glitches when you're trying to get this assignment due. So it always depends in each case. What do you have time for when you're trying to teach? As digital humanities become more and more important, whatever that means, I start to think that needs to be built into the 
undergraduate and graduate PhD program, and students are now coming here because we offer such a, a digital approach to Egyptology. So I'm trying to think, how do we how do we give the students more course credit for learning these skills instead of just hoping they'll pick some of them up along the way? That's a that's an important point. And give a quick demonstration of what it's like to um, find a tomb on this website. And I'll show you what I mean about linking everything together. So let's say I'm interested in tomb 2110, and I find it. And you can see all the stuff there. So over here, I can't really read the numbers from there, but all of these photographs, for example, all the related items that are all here. And once we get our Mirador stuff up and running, things like the image viewer will be so much cooler. And you'll be able to um, zoom on these and annotate them and save them to your collection and share them with colleagues, and, um, magnify them and do all kinds of cool stuff. So all of this comes from that one single tune. Everything from photos from 1906 to 1993 to 2011, whenever I might have taken these color shots. So there you go. One last question, Peter. Yeah. Um, let's say somebody wanted one of these 3D printed scarabs or show tees or something like that. Would you go to the Semitic Museum shop or would you, what would you do? If we wanted to sell them the 3D printed or if they wanted, wanted to, to, to purchase that. one from the audience? Yeah. Um, <laughs> We haven't quite done any mass production yet, and you know it's not really the uh, economically smartest way to do it, especially if printing out a statue takes 60 hours. <laughs> you know, getting your inventory up to speed will take a year. Um, so the way to really do that, if you had a really good one, like that head there, is to print one, make a mold, send the mold to China, and mass produce it there, and then, and then come back. You could go on our Sketchfab page eventually, and I'll link our Sketchfab page to our Semitic Museum page, and as I said, I'm making all of our objects downloadable. So people could grab one, download it, and print it themselves. Um, that's an option. Um, since ours were scanned with that structured light scanner, they should print pretty well. If you did a model from photogrammetry, from taking 100 pictures with your camera and stitching them together in PhotoScan, those won't print as well. They won't be as sharp and, and uh, wonderful. So that's why we're happy we got that scanner and did our collection that way. Every few years, the resolution increases, and you got to do them all again. So, don't throw those antiquities away. That's the model of the story. <laughs> Other question? You've been a wonderful captive audience. Thanks so much for braving the cold to come out today. Appreciate it.